thank you for watching. It's time for talk. Each evening at this time, Monday through Friday, Rosemary interviews local personalities and others who bring items of interest to this community. Time for Talk is a community betterment service. Tonight, Rosemary takes us by means of portable camera out of our studios and maybe into your neighborhood. And now, it's time for Talk. Tonight, we're continuing to unfold the story of this Missouri boot heel. There are so many things to tell. A part of our problem was the selection of what should be included and what part we could leave out. Our thanks go to so many who gave us their personal testimonies. Also to the Missouri Historical Society, to PBS, and to the many history sources we consulted. tractors and other improved farming techniques and the growing mechanization slowly began to erode the demand for croppers. Additionally, attempts to organize tenants and croppers into unions continued. These attempts brought immediate reaction from the landowners. When a cropper was suspected of union activity, he was simply forced off the land and for one or more reasons, he found himself more and more distressed. There was 10, 15 families thrown right out of their homes. A hundred folks, and no place to live but on the road. The Rances, the Peterses, the Perrys, the Joneses, one right after the other, they got thrown out. Half the folks, you and me know, thrown right Agitation for a union spread from northeast Arkansas to southeast Missouri. So that on the evening of January 9, 1939, sharecroppers, ex-sharecroppers, renters, and day laborers took their small and meager belongings to set up housekeeping along the highways to demonstrate their intolerable economic condition. They had determined that they had just as well starve and freeze on the highways as in their shacks. Their camps were scattered along 38 miles of US 60 east and west and 70 miles of US 61 north and south, forming a cross with Sykeston at the center. Estimates of the numbers vary from 251 to 450 families, depending on which governmental agency was reporting. The St. Louis Post-Dispatch sent reporters to cover the demonstration. Most of these photographs come from the paper's cameras. At first, nobody believed the report, but landowners were galvanized into action. They said the situation was a result of normal year-end procedures and denied that croppers were being evicted. Their news release is interesting. This movement, they said, to the highways of this county is the result of unscrupulous and scheming agitators who have been deceiving the tenants and sharecroppers by making them believe that they were going to be given property and money by the government and that they will not have to work. However, earlier attempts by the United States government to alleviate the plight of displaced sharecroppers uh, seem to contradict much of these allegations. For example, in 1935, a test project was organized in the Woodlake community in Texas. This consisted of 100 families on relief. These families moved into 1,600 acres of government land where each received a three-acre plot. They constructed their houses, which included modern baths to exact design specifications, and cooperatively farmed 1,200 acres and shared a community school with a park and a trading post. The families moved in to rent the land for $180 per year. In addition, in January 1937, 
7,000 acres of land just north of New Madrid at La Forge was secured for the relocation of 150 families onto what were called family size farms on which sharecroppers and tenants would be given a chance to begin again. Included in the purchase were the cotton gin. Thousands of applications for participation were received. In this case, each family was allocated 55 to 65 acres depending on the productivity of the land. The farmers worked the land using jointly owned machines. The government leased the land on a year-to-year -year basis for one-fourth of the cotton production, or about $50 per year. The tenant could apply all the lease payments to the eventual purchase of the land. The FSA, the Federal Security Administration, provided trained home economists to make sure that each home had a pressure cooker and assisted with the canning as well as furnishing and decorating the new houses. Housewives began canning large amounts of fruits and vegetables to take them through the winter months. While the distress of these sharecroppers and tenants represented the culmination of years of difficulty with the landowners in the Mississippi Delta, as far north as uh, Sykeston. Very few of the protesters came from Dunklin County. Someone has said that Dunklin County was spared this problem because of inherent honest business relationships between landowners and tenants or sharecroppers. People would bring their corn and put it in this barn and you gathered three loads for yourself and one for Mr. Shelton. And every, all those farmers were real, real truthful people. And in fact, they uh, really tried to see that Mr. Shelton's load of corn had ever ear in it that it should have in it. Okay. Right. I mean, you didn't, uh, you didn't doubt it at all. A lot of places that they didn't have that good a relationship with the landowners. And some of the landowners would not... Uh, uh, well, they take advantage of the people. They might not, they might be illiterate, they couldn't read, and uh, they would charge them extra for their uh, stuff And uh, when they bought it at the store, and then they would, uh, uh, wouldn't deal fairly with them uh, whenever they settled up. Okay. Uh, most of those uh, places had a company store, and I know down in, in Arkansas, southeast, uh, northeast Arkansas, they had a company store down there. And my uncle, he uh, was affiliated down there with that, and uh, they give them, they issued them company uh, money. It wasn't money; it was paper. But they they could spend it only at the company store, and they raised the prices whatever they wanted to get it. And that was the same. Uh, that was one of the situations that existed too, up around Sykeston at Catron. And uh, I know one instance up there at the uh, store that. Uh, uh, during the Saturday evening rush and night rush, it, they, they had all the business, most of the business was did Saturday afternoon, Saturday night in the company store. Someone got out with a, a pair of hip boots that wasn't charged to anyone. So they just charged it to everyone. Then in the fall of the year, whenever they began paying, well, anybody that complained about it, they marked it off. If they didn't, well, they it accepted the payment from everybody. If you're sharecropping, it was supposed to be divided equal between the sharecropper and the landowner. But sometimes it wasn't. But uh, in our case, it was. It was divided equal. I happen to know of one instance down in the, in the uh, on a plantation down in uh, northeast Arkansas, whenever they, uh, they, uh, this particular man, he, uh, he uh, uh, slipped out and picked a bale of cotton and put it in and stored it in the room in his home till after he settled up with the with the uh, plantation owner and he just come out even. So then he went down and he, he got his bale of cotton out and he's going to sell it. He's going to have that much money extra. But they, they, they found a mistake in their books and they took that one too. Most of the big landowners in Duncan County was pretty reliable men. In Duncan County, the big landowners was an individual. Down there, it might be a company. And they would hire a man, and, and he was, he'd make his salary. He was supposed to get his salary 
uh, off of the tenants. And of course, uh, uh, that's like the old tax collectors in the Bible. You know, they, they could raise it a little and, and make a little more money, you know, and so that's the way they do it. Uh, this does not mean, however, that the effect of FSA activity was not felt in Dunklin County. Our family lived at Shields, Missouri, and we moved south of Cardinal. He had eight kids, and he settled on 40 acres of ground, which the government owned. And we farmed that ground for approximately three or four years before the government sold the ground to my father. We had uh, choices of, of picking the places where we lived on that government ground. And he let us move up to a big house because we had such a large family. And it had 50 acres on it. And he's, they sold the 50 acres to my father for 40 year payment. No money down. They built us a new house on the farm. They built us a big barn. They built us an outhouse and they built us a chicken house on the farm. And approximately every once a week there would be a lady come around and teach my, my mother about cooking and health, health problems. There was approximately 10 different families that bought ground that year on that same piece of ground that the government owned south of Cardwell, Missouri. And uh, they all had the same situation that we did. They bought their ground and no money down. And my daddy paid his ground out 40 years. <laughs> he, he, he just barely couldn't make the payment, but he made it. Never missed one. And he raised those kids, eight of us, on 50 acres of ground. My father depended on our family. I was the oldest one in the, in, for the children. And I would go on and I'd do the plowing. My mother would take the smaller kids and they'd do the chopping. And it came along that we had to gather the crop that all of us would do the picking. My daddy would haul the cotton off with a team of mules. And we'd uh, pick till he got back in, her, in, in pick sacks because we didn't have anywhere to empty our cotton. By the, time, by the time we'd get all of our pick sacks full, he'd be back for, <laughs> for us to empty. One good, one good thing about our, our family and all the families that lived around us is we, we produced enough food for us to never be hungry. My daddy had a cow. He raised hogs. My mother raised chickens. We raised a big garden, and we canned. And that's another thing the government lady would help us, help my mother do, is teach her how to can all those foods. I don't ever remember the time during a depression that we ever went hungry for anything. You have been watching Time for Talk. Time for Talk is a community betterment service designed to cooperate with our local community betterment program. Each evening, Monday through Friday at this time, Rosemary interviews local personalities and others who bring items of interest to this community. Time for Talk is brought to you through the cooperation of Kennett Cable Vision Incorporated and is produced through the facilities of the Slicer Street Church. The Holy Scriptures come alive.